Mutton yesterday, mutton today, and blimey if it don't look like mutton again tomorrow, said one of the trolls. Never a blinking bit of man flesh have we had for long enough, said a second. What the hell William was a thinking of to bring us into these parts at all beats me, William choked. Shut your mouth, he said as soon as he could. You can't expect folk to stop here forever just to be et by you and Bert. You've had a village and an half between you since we came down from the mountains. How much more do you want? After hearing all this, Bilbo thought he must do something at once. He should have gone back quietly and warned his friends, but he decided to do a bit of good, quick burgling. He could not go straight back to Thorin and company empty-handed. So, at last, he crept behind a tree just behind William, plucked up courage, and put his little hand in William's enormous pocket. There was a purse in it, as big as a bag to Bilbo. Ah, this is a beginning. It was. William turned round at once and grabbed Bilbo by the neck before he could duck behind the tree. Blimey, Bert, look what I've copped, said William. What is it? said the others coming up. Lummy if I knows. What are ya? Bilbo Baggins, a bird, a hobbit. A bird, a hobbit? said they, a bit startled. What's a bird, a hobbit got to do with my pockets anyway? said William. And can you cook em? said Tom. You can try, said Bert. He wouldn't make a mouthful, said William. Not when he was skinned and boned. Perhaps there are more like him about, and we might make a pie, said Bert. Here, you. Any more of you sneaking in these here woods, you nasty little rabbit? Yes, lots, said Bilbo. Uh, no, none at all. Not one. What you mean, said Bert. What I say, said Bilbo, gasping. And please don't cook me, kind sirs. I'm a good cook. I'll cook a perfectly beautiful breakfast for you, if only you won't have me for supper. Poor little blighter, said William. Poor little blighter. Let him go. Not till he says what he means by lots and none at all, said Bert. I don't want to have me throat cut in me sleep. Hold his toes in the fire till he talks. I won't have it, said William. I caught him anyway. You're a fat fool, William, said Bert, as I've said afore this evening. And you're a lout. And I won't take that from you, Billuggins, says Bert, and put his fist in William's eye. There was a gorgeous row. Bilbo had just enough wits left when Bert dropped him on the ground to scramble out of the way. Soon the trolls were locked in one another's arms and rolling nearly into the fire, kicking and thumping. Right in the middle of the fight, up came Balin. The dwarves had heard noises from a distance, and after waiting for some time for Bilbo to come back, or to hoot like an owl, they started off one by one to creep towards the light as quietly as they could. No sooner did Tom see Balin come into the light than he gave an awful howl. Bert and Bill stopped fighting immediately. Before Balin knew what was happening, a sack was over his head, and he was down. "'There's more to come yet,' said Tom, "'or I'm mighty mistook.' Lots and none at all it is, he said. No barrow hobbits, but lots of these here dwarves. Let's get out of the light. And they did. With sacks in their hands, they waited in the shadows. As each dwarf came up, pop, a nasty, smelly sack went over his head. Soon Dwaylin lay by Balin, then Feely and Keely together, then all of them piled in a great heap, uncomfortably near the fire. That'll teach em, said Tom. A nice pickle they were all in now, all neatly tied up in sacks with three angry trolls arguing whether they should roast them, mince them, boil them, or just sit on them one by one and squash them into jelly. And Bilbo up in a bush, with his clothes and his skin torn, not daring to move for fear they should hear him. It was just then that Gandalf came back. But no one saw him. The trolls had just decided to roast the dwarves now and eat them later, that was Bert's idea, and after a lot of argument, they had all agreed to it. Well, no good roasting em now. It'll take all night, said a voice. Bert thought it was William's. Don't start the argument all over again, Bill, he said. Who's arguing? said William, who thought it was Bert that had spoken. 
You are. You're a liar. And so the argument began all over again. No good boiling them. We ain't got no water. And it's a long way to the well and all, said a voice. Bert and William thought it was Tom's. Shut up, they said. Shut up yourself, said Tom, who thought it was William's voice. You're a booby. Booby yourself. And so the argument began all over again, and went on hotter than ever, until at last they decided to sit on the sacks one by one and squash them and boil them next time. Who shall we sit on first, said the voice. Better sit on the last fella first. He thought Tom was talking. Don't talk to yourself, but if you want to sit on the last one, sit on him. Which is he? The one with the yellow stockings. Nonsense, the one with the grey stockings, said a voice like William's. I made sure it was yellow. Yellow it was. Then what did you say it was grey for? I never did, Tom said it. That I never did, it was you. Two to one, so shut your mouth. Who are you a-talking to? said William. Now stop it, said Tom and Bert together. The light's getting on and dawn comes early. Let's get on with it. Dawn take you all and be stoned to you, said a voice that sounded like William's, but it wasn't. For just at that moment the light came over the hill, and William never spoke again, for he stood turned to stone as he stooped, and Bert and Tom were stuck like rocks as they looked at him. And there they stand to this day, for trolls must be underground before dawn, or they go back to the stuff of the mountains they are made of, and never move again. Excellent, said Gandalf, as he stepped from behind a tree, and helped Bilbo to climb down out of a thorn bush. Then Bilbo understood. It was the wizard's voice that had kept the trolls bickering and quarrelling, until the light came and made an end of them. They untied the sacks and released the furious dwarfs. They had to hear Bilbo's account of what had happened to him twice over before they were satisfied. "'Silly time to go practising pinching and pocket-picking,' said Bomber, "'when what we wanted was fire and food.' "'And that's just what you wouldn't have got of those fellows "'without a struggle in any case,' said Gandalf. "'Anyhow, you're wasting time now.' Don't you realize that the trolls must have a cave or a hole dug somewhere near to hide from the sun in? We must find it. They followed the tracks up the hill, until, hidden by bushes, they came on a big door of stone leading to a cave. But they could not open it, not though they all pushed while Gandalf tried various incantations. Would this be any good? asked Bilbo. I found it on the ground where the trolls had their fight. He held out a large key. Gandalf grabbed it and fitted it into the keyhole. The stone door swung back with one big push, and they all went inside. There were bones on the floor, and a nasty smell was in the air, but there was a good deal of food jumbled carelessly on shelves, and pots full of gold coins, clothes hanging on the walls, and several swords of various makes, shapes, and sizes. Two caught their eyes particularly, because of their beautiful scabbards and jewelled hilts. Gandalf and Thorin each took one of these, and Bilbo took a knife in a leather sheath. It would have made only a tiny pocket knife for a troll, but it was as good as a short sword for the hobbit. Let's get out of this horrible smell, said Feely. So they carried out the pot of coins, and such food as was untouched and looked fit to eat, and a barrel of ale which was still full. By that time they felt like breakfast. After they had slept, they all mounted up once more, and jogged along again on the path towards the east. "'Where did you go to, if I may ask?' said Thorin to Gandalf as they rode along. "'To look ahead. And what brought you back in the nick of time?' "'Looking behind.' "'Exactly. But could you be more plain?' "'I went on to spy out our road. It will soon become dangerous and difficult.' I had not gone very far, however, when I met a couple of friends of mine from Rivendell. "'Where's that?' asked Bilbo. "'Don't interrupt,' said Gandalf. "'As I was saying, I met two of Elrond's people. They were hurrying along for fear of the trolls. It was they who told me that three of them had come down from the mountains. I immediately had a feeling that I was wanted back, so now you know. Please be more careful next time, or we shall never get anywhere.' Thank you, said Thorin.
They did not sing or tell stories that day, even though the weather improved, nor the next day, nor the day after. They had begun to feel that danger was not far away on either side. One morning, fording a river at a wide, shallow place, they saw that the great mountains had marched down very near to them. "'Is that the mountain?' asked Bilbo in a solemn voice. "'Of course not,' said Balin. "'That is only the beginning of the misty mountains, and we have got to get through or over or under those somehow before we can come into the wilderland beyond. And it is a deal of a way even from there to the lonely mountain.' Now Gandalf led the way. They asked him where he was making for. You are come to the very edge of the wild. Hidden somewhere ahead of us is the fair valley of Rivendell, where Elrond lives in the last homely house. I sent a message by my friends, and we are expected. That sounded nice and comforting. But they had not got there yet, and it was not as easy as it sounds to find the last homely house west of the mountains. After what seemed ages, they came to the edge of a steep fall in the ground so suddenly that Gandalf's horse nearly slipped down the slope. "'Here it is at last,' he called. Bilbo never forgot the way they slithered and slipped in the dusk down the steep zigzag path into the secret valley of Rivendell. The spirits rose as they went down and down. The trees changed to beech and oak, and there was a comfortable feeling in the twilight. Mm. It smells like elves, thought Bilbo, and he looked up at the stars. They were burning bright and blue. Just then there came a burst of song like laughter in the trees. Oh, what are you doing? Oh, where are you going? Your ponies need chewing. The river is flowing. Oh, tra la 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 here down in the valley. Oh, where are you going? With beards all the wagging. No knowing, no knowing, what brings Mr. Baggins and Balin and Dwaylin down into the valley in June? Ha ha! Oh, will you be staying? Or will you be flying? Your ponies are straying, the daylight is dying. To fly would be folly, to stay would be jolly, and listen and hark till the end of the dark to our tune. Ha ha! They were elves, of course. Soon Bilbo caught glimpses of them as the darkness deepened. He loved elves, though he seldom met them, but he was a little frightened of them, too. Dwarves don't get on well with them. At last, one, a tall young fellow, came out from the trees and bowed to Gandalf and to Thorin. "'Welcome to the valley,' he said. "'Thank you,' said Thorin, a bit gruffly. But Gandalf was already off his horse and among the elves, talking merrily with them. "'Supper is preparing over there,' he said. Tired as he was, Bilbo would have liked to stay a while. Elvish singing is not a thing to miss in June under the stars. But the dwarves were all for supper as soon as possible and would not stay. They all came to the last homely house and found its doors flung wide. The master of the house was Elrond, as noble and as fair in face as an elf lord, as strong as a warrior, as wise as a wizard, as venerable as a king of dwarves, and as kind as summer. Evil things did not come into the valley. All of them, even the ponies, grew refreshed and strong in a few days there. So the time came to Midsummer Eve, and they were to go on again with the early sun on Midsummer morning. Elrond knew all about ruins of every kind. That day he looked at the swords they had brought from the troll's lair, and he said, These are not troll make. They are old swords, very old swords of the high elves of the west, my kin. They were made in Gondolin for the goblin walls. This, Thorin, the runes name Orchrist, the goblin cleaver in the ancient tongue of Gondolin. It was a famous blade. This, Gandalf, was Glandring, foe-hammer, that the king of Gondolin once wore. Keep them well. Thorin bowed. I will keep this sword in honour, he said. May it soon cleave goblins once again. 
"'A wish that is to be granted soon enough in the mountains,' said Elrond. "'But show me your map.' The moon was shining in a broad silver crescent. He held up the map, and the white light shone through it. "'What is this?' he said. "'There are moon letters here, beside the plain runes which say five feet high the door and three may walk abreast.' "'What are moon letters?' asked the hobbit, full of excitement. "'Moon letters are rune letters,' said Elrond. "'They can only be seen when the moon shines behind them, "'and it must be a moon of the same shape and season as the day when they were written. "'These must have been written on a midsummer's eve in a crescent moon a long while ago.' "'What do they say?' asked Gandalf and Thorin together. "'Stand by the grey stone when the thrush knocks.' read Elrond, and the setting sun with the last light of Durin's day will shine upon the keyhole. What is Durin's day? asked Elrond. The first day of the dwarf's new year, said Thorin, the first day of the last moon of autumn on the threshold of winter. Is there any more writing? None to be seen by this moon, said Elrond. The next morning was a midsummer morning as fair and fresh as could be dreamed. Blue sky and never a cloud, and the sun dancing on the water. They rode away amid songs of farewell and good speed, with their hearts ready for more adventure, towards the misty mountains and the land beyond. Long days after they had left Rivendell, they were still going up and up and up. It was a hard, dangerous path, and it was getting bitterly cold. Even the good plans of wise wizards go astray sometimes when you are off on dangerous adventures, and Gandalf was a wise enough wizard to know it. He hardly dared to hope that they would pass without fearful adventure over those great tall mountains with lonely peaks and valleys where no king ruled. They did not. All was well until one day they met a thunderstorm. More than a thunderstorm, a thunder battle. Bilbo had never seen or imagined anything of the kind. They were high up in a narrow place, with a dreadful fall into a dim valley at one side of them. There they were, sheltering under a hanging rock for the night, and he lay beneath a blanket and shook from head to toe. When he peeped out in the lightning flashes, he saw that across the valley the stone giants were out, and were hurling rocks at one another for a game, and catching them, and tossing them down into the darkness where they smashed among the trees far below, or splintered into little bits with a bang. Then came the wind and rain and hail, and the overhanging rock was no protection at all. "'This won't do,' said Thorin. "'If we don't get blown off, or drowned, or struck by lightning, then we shall be picked up by some giant and kicked sky-high for a football.' "'Well, if you know anywhere better, take us there,' said Gandalf, who was feeling very grumpy, and was far from happy about the giants himself. So he sent Feely and Keely to look for a better shelter. Soon they came crawling back, holding on to the rocks in the wind. "'We have found a dry cave,' they said. "'Not far round the next corner.' "'Have you thoroughly explored it?' said the wizard, who knew that caves up in the mountains were seldom unoccupied. "'Yes, yes,' they said. "'It isn't all that big, and it does not seem to go far back.' "'That, of course, is the dangerous part about caves. "'You don't know how far they go back sometimes, "'or where a passage may lead to, or what is waiting for you inside.' "'As they passed under the arch, it was good to hear the wind and the rain outside "'instead of all about them, and to feel safe from the giants and their rocks.' "'It seemed quite a fair size, not too large and mysterious.' It had a dry floor and some comfortable nooks. Bilbo could not go to sleep for a long while, and when he did, he had very nasty dreams. He dreamt that a crack in the wall at the back of the cave got bigger and bigger and opened wider and wider. He woke up with a horrible start and found that part of his dream was true. A crack had opened at the back of the cave and was already a wide passage. He gave a very loud yell, as loud a yell as a hobbit can give, which is surprising for their size. Out jumped the goblins, huge goblins. There were six to each dwarf at least, and two even for Bilbo, and they were all grabbed and carried through the crack. But not Gandalf. Bilbo's yell had done that much good. 
It had wakened him up wide in a splintering second, and when goblins came to grab him, there was a terrific flash like lightning in the cave, a smell like gunpowder, and several of them fell dead. The crack closed with a snap, and Bilbo and the dwarves were on the wrong side of it. The goblins were very rough and pinched unmercifully and chuckled and laughed and sang in their horrible stony voices as they carried off their prisoners. Clap, snap, the black, crack, grip, grab, pinch, nub, and down, down, to goblin town, you go, my lad. Clash, crash, crush, smash, hammer and tongs, knocker and tongs, pound, pound, far on the ground, ho, ho, my lad. Swish, smack, whip, crack, batter and beat, yammer and bleat, work, work, not dare to shirk, while goblins cough and goblins laugh, round and round, far underground, below, my lad. What that meant was only too plain. Out came their whips and the goblins lashed them with a swish, smack, and set them running as fast as they could in front of them. With their hands linked and chained behind their backs, they were dragged to the far end of the cavern, with little Bilbo tugging at the end of the line. There in the shadows, on a large flat stone, sat a tremendous goblin with a huge head, and armed goblins were standing round him carrying the axes and the bent swords that they use. Now, goblins are cruel and evil. They hated everybody and everything, but they had a special grudge against Thorin's people. Who are these miserable persons? said the great goblin. Dwarves and this said one of the drivers, pulling at Bilbo's chain so that he fell forward onto his knees. We found them sheltering in our front porch. What do you mean by it? said the great goblin, turning to Thorin. Murderers and friends of elves. What have you got to say? Thorin the dwarf, at your service, he replied. We sheltered from a storm in what seemed a convenient cave. Nothing was further from our thoughts than inconveniencing goblins in any way whatsoever. Hmm, said the great goblin. So you say. What are you doing in the mountains? Where are you going to? Thorin Oakenshield, I know too much about your folk already. Let's have the truth, or I will prepare something particularly uncomfortable for you. We are on a journey to uh, visit our relatives who live on the east side of these truly hospitable mountains, said Thorin. He is a liar, a tremendous one, said one of the drivers. Several of our people were struck by lightning in the cave. They are as dead as stones. Also, he has not explained this. He held out the sword which Thorin had worn, the sword which came from the troll's lair. The great goblin gave a truly awful howl of rage when he looked at it, and all his soldiers gnashed their teeth, clashed their shields, and stamped. Murderers and elf friends, the great goblin shouted, slash them, beat them, gnash them, take them away to dark halls full of snakes, and never let them see the light again. With a scream, he rushed at Thorin. Just at that moment, all the lights in the cavern went out, and the great fire went off, poof! into a tower of blue glowing smoke, right up to the roof, scattering piercing white sparks all among the goblins. Oh, the yells and yammering, croaking, gibbering and jabbering, howls, growls and curses, shrieking and striking that followed. Suddenly a sword flashed in its own light. Bilbo saw it go right through the great goblin. He fell dead, and the goblin soldiers fled before the sword, shrieking into the darkness. Follow me quick, said a voice, fierce and quiet. Before they understood what was happening, they were trotting along again with Bilbo at the end of the line. A pale light was leading them on. Quicker, quicker, said the voice. The torches will soon be relit. Then Gandalf lit up his wand. Of course it was Gandalf. But just then they were too busy to ask how he got there. He took out his sword again, and again it flashed in the dark by itself. It burned with a rage that made it gleam if goblins were about. Now it was as bright as blue flame for delight in the killing of the great lord of the cave. It made no trouble whatever of cutting through the goblin chains and setting all the prisoners free as quickly as possible. Are we all here? said he. Let me see. Yes, yes, yes. But where's Mr. Baggins? Ah, here's Mr. Baggins. Fourteen. Well, well, it might be worse, and then again it might be a good deal better.
No ponies and no food, and no knowing quite where we are, and hordes of angry goblins just behind. On we go. Soon they could hear even the flap of the goblin feet, many, many feet, which seemed only just round the last corner. The blink of red torches could be seen behind them in the tunnel. Gandalf fell behind, and Thorin with him. They turned a sharp corner. About turn, he shouted. Draw your sword, Thorin. There was nothing else to be done, and the goblins did not like it. They came scurrying round the corner in full cry, and found goblin cleaver and foe hammer shining cold and bright in their astonished eyes. The ones in front dropped their torches and gave one yell before they were killed. The ones behind yelled still more and leapt back, knocking over those that were running after them. Biter and beater, they shrieked, running for their lives. On went the dwarves again, a long way on, but the goblins put out their torches and slipped on soft shoes, and their fastest runners with the sharpest ears and eyes ran forward, swift as weasels in the dark, and with hardly any more noise than bats. Quite suddenly Dory, now at the back again carrying Bilbo, was grabbed from behind in the dark. He shouted and fell, and the hobbit rolled off his shoulders into the blackness, bumped his head on hard rock, and remembered nothing more. Ariel Natris Oris Barzi Bedhead Duchel Dementa? Yeah, I'm not so.